Um, welcome back, everybody, to the Methods in Sinology series. Um, as you know, this is a lecture series aimed to introduce research practices in different subfields of sinology. Um, and we are delighted, uh, of course, today to welcome back uh, Professor Joachim Kurtz, uh, Professor of Intellectual History and Chinese at the University of Heidelberg, to um, pick off uh, pick up from the uh, from his last lecture on um, Chinese logic. So Professor Kurtz, thank you very much. And I will hand over the floor to you. Great, so thank you very much, Marianne and um, Henry for the second opportunity to try to pitch what I think is, is a, a very important um, and still kind of neglected um, field of work. I'm still not a historian of science as you will see. Um, and so I'll start out as a historian of logic and I think I, I will go down a sliding scale sort of to go, get further and further away, but I still think there's some implications of what I want, what I want to talk about today for our understanding of what we now call Chinese cultures of reasoning or Chinese cultures of validation. Um, what I would like to do today um, is the following. Um, so I will try to outline again, sort of uh, very briefly, um, where we were when I ended last time. Um, and then I will say something about where I think our field um, should be heading. So I'll, I'll trace a little bit that um, maybe the search for logical theorizing is not the most promising route of research, and we should rather look um, into practices of argumentation. Um, in, in particular, I'm interested in evidentiary practices and standards of validity, um, as I have been working with a couple of colleagues over the past couple of years. Um, and then sort of by, by means of case studies, um, I want to introduce something that I've been uh, working on recently, namely um, still evidentiary practices and still standards of validity and cultures of reasoning and validation, um, but exemplified through deceptive practices, the arts of deception. Um, and I will focus on um, um, two uh, fields that I'm, I'm quite blissfully ignorant of, but have started to look into, namely legal culture um, and, and the history of medicine. And I'll give you some examples of what I think might be um, very fruitful um, routes uh, of inquiry to understand how arguments um, become validated or have become validated um, in late imperial Chinese history. And then I will end with some implications um, what um, studies of cultures of reasoning or cultures of validations might actually um, bring to us. So um, for those of you who were there, you might recall that what I tried to do last time was to reconstruct the tripod of logical traditions that we have. And I, I sort of I made a pitch and, and saying that this tripod perhaps is not as stable as it looks here. Um, and I told the, the story of how the third leg, the Chinese leg, was basically constructed between 1898 and, and 1905. Um, this is pretty much where I left off, where also my, my book um, stopped. But I, I, I saw um, Jan Ferhofsky is in, in the audience, and I think he's writing the sequel to the book that I was too lazy to, to ever um, <laughs> try. At least he has certain essays that will help you understand what happened after I picked off. But um, I, I don't want to retell this whole story again. I just want to remind you of a couple of things um, of what I think is the trouble with the tripod, why the leg doesn't really hold. Um, one is the scant evidence that we have. So we have a shortage of relevant evidence, as I um, tried to outline last time. So it's not that we have no traces at all of explicit logical theorizing in ancient, medieval, or late imperial Chinese texts, but all in all, um, it's not really a great deal that we do have. Um, also, the fragments that we actually possess and that have been interpreted uh, very, very skillfully over the last 150 years, basically, by people in China and Japan and also in, in various Western countries, um, were largely forgotten throughout Chinese history. So the claim that they actually had any impact on argumentative practices is very far-fetched. People knew of some of these texts, but they, it didn't, they didn't shape by any means their argumentative practices. And, and so therefore, that's one problem that we have to reckon with, and, and that might guide us um, to um, a different understanding of what's necessary to be done. Uh, the second um, thing that I find is problematic is um, that the studies that I've been reviewing last time um, were, in my view, based on quite problematic assumptions. Uh, one is that um, the idea that early Chinese thought was as foundational, even in the realm of logic, as allegedly um, the Aristotelian organon was throughout Western history. And we know that that's also not true. 
I think, reproduces classical biases that have been overcome um, by classical scholars um, in the West already, but we find them now in China. So if you if you just study the Mojing and you insist that the Mojing and the Gong Song Lung were basically the foundational texts for every practice of reasoning that came ever after in Chinese history, that doesn't strike me as a very convincing argument simply because the texts were not there. The Mojing was in the, in the dark corners of the Taoist canon and it was muddled and couldn't be read and Gong Song Lung was treated as something morally dubious and not very influential. So that's one of the assumptions that I find um, um, not very convincing. The other one is um, that interpretations that identify parallels to shifting logical theory uh, smacks of modernist, um, and I forgot a word there, um, biases I wanted to say, <laughs> namely, so the idea that whatever logical theory is en vogue in the West must have been anticipated in the Mo Jing strikes me as, as not very convincing. And if you trace sort of what has been done to the Mojing throughout um, the 20th century, it starts out uh, with basically with finding Aristotle in the Mozart. And then after 20 years or so in the 1920s, you find Bayes um, uh, or any other trace of mathematical logic. And now when we have sort of a turn towards um, dialogic, dynamical logics, we find that too in, in these very few innocent pieces um, uh, of the Mozart. What I find wrong with that is, is not so much that the attempt, and I think you, you can make the more the, the more the speak to all of these things, but just that it has to be um, validated by what is contemporary en vogue, and otherwise it doesn't matter. That is something that I, I, I think is also um, very harmful to our understanding of classical texts and also of the history of logic. Um, the, the classical scholar Sally Humphreys, that some of you may have heard about, he's a historian of, of Greek um, thought and, and society, she has a, a very nice essay called Demodernizing the Classics that I found as a great inspiration. So if you ever look at that, it's, it's published in some hidden um, um, edited volume, um, but you will find it. Um, and I think she explains it very, very well, that these modernist biases basically um, sort of forestall a more productive engagement with classical texts. And that's, I think, also true. And, and of course, uh, what many of our colleagues have been doing, sort of now with the Gung Sun Lung, recent work at Zurich and, and other things, of course, avoids these modernist traps, but we have to overcome them. And then finally, the, the third problematic assumption that I think is underlying these um, attempts to um, reestablish the tripod in all its glory is that um, we search for equivalence of something like the Aristotelian organon. So there must have been a set of rules that actually informed everyone's actual practice of argumentation. And, and that's a very arbitrary um, Eurocentric prejudice of how um, practices of argumentation actually work. So I, I, I think what is perhaps the most interesting and the most promising route for us when looking into Chinese practices of argumentation is that we can unsettle this equation between um, an organon and then the practices derived from them. That doesn't seem to be the case even within European history, but Chinese history is a very, very strong proof that you don't need this organon to have absolutely rational, um, <laughs> contradiction-free, more or less, um, uh, practices that we would immediately identify uh, as reasonable and good and valid arguments. So, so I think we'll have to bracket all these three assumptions and we have to try and go over them. Now, <laughs> you may have noticed that this is all kind of a, a deconstructionist enterprise in a way. Uh, and, and so you, you could think that, you know, what we end up with is then this picture, right? So, so I have proven that the tripod doesn't stand and it gives you great satisfaction as, as a youthful deconstructionist and, and you feel really good about yourself and you consider the job done. And, and then you wake up the next morning and you think, all right, now what? Um, what can we do now? Um, and that took me and, and a couple of colleagues quite a while because you, you get over the satisfaction very, very quickly. And then you think, no, but there's so much material that is actually interested, interesting in um, Chinese history, throughout Chinese history. It's the richest um, uh, written culture on earth, probably. It's full of contestation, of argumentation, of refutation and all that, and rejections. And so there must be something in it, even if we cannot point to this one organ that we would like to find if we were to model Chinese history on the, on the uh, blueprint of what happened in Europe. So what I think um, we could do and that's something that um, a couple of colleagues um, together with me have worked on, on for several years. There's Rui Magone, Ari Levine, Martin Hofmann, um, and many, many others, um, is sort of to try and um, um, develop a new view, not so much about logical theorizing in China, but of what we can learn from looking into argumentative practices in China and practices of argumentation. What that entails is that we have to shift our perspective. So if we do not 
just search for theoretical fragments that may or may not be there, but are, are just very, very limited in, in size and may not tell us too much. Um, it's much more important to reconstruct concrete practices of argumentation, to actually look into how people argued in practice. And the more context we have, the better. Um, also, um, I think we need a shift in focus. So the perspective is we no longer chase just fragments, but we shift the focus instead of tracing explicit rules of reasoning, which were codified in something like the organon, what we should aim for is to understand the mostly implicit epistemic ideals, as historians of science call them, and the standards of validity embodied in argumentative practices. Um, and we thought, and we tried to prove, and, and we're still working on, um, 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 to work out, uh, to try and show um, that this is actually um, a fruitful and hopefully productive approach. So now, what what that would entail more specifically um, is, is a list of things that would look a bit like that. So if you want to um, reconstruct um, standards of validity in argumentative practices, what we need to recover are things such as the following: we have to focus on conventions of description, habits of inference and analogy, and ways of using. And, dis uh, and disputing evidence. So we need to understand how something was described, uh, was presented as coherent, corresponding to a certain fact that um, uh, the authors want to, uh, want to present. We have to look into the habits of inference and analogy. So how do they draw analogies? Why do they draw analogies? And why are they uh, considered to be convincing? Um, and of course, we have to look into the evidentiary practices, sort of how is um, testimony presented, oral testimony, written testimony, what's the role of um, sacred texts and others. Um, and that's so that's one uh, part of our job to try and get a hold of all these um, different things. Then um, from these um, analyses of um, habits of inference and, and ways of using evidence, we should try to infer the implicit and sometimes explicit criteria of veracity, credibility, coherence, relevance, applicability, et cetera. So we have to look into how these different ways of presenting evidence, of making use of evidence, of contesting evidence are actually evaluated in the terms um, that the actors use. So we have to look into the terms that are used in order to evaluate claims and arguments by other people. We can do that in law, but also in, in exegetical practice. And I'll give you some examples later. Um, so that is very important that we actually try to get a hold of our actors, languages of evaluation. How do they evaluate a witness to be credible, trustworthy, um, morally volatile, um, perhaps visually impaired, or all that? Um, and, and so for that, we need, and, and I think, you know, a digital humanities specialist wouldn't hurt, we need to compile a large compendia of all these terms uh, that we have and how they changed over time. We will then have to look, once we have this database of the terms of evaluation, um, we will have to look into the sources from which these meta languages, these evaluative languages, second order languages are built. Uh, and these sources um, can be classical texts, but they can also be um, things that you would not uh, immediately identify. So, so we started looking a little bit into um, the terminology that is used to evaluate um, Baguen, eight-legged essays. And we found that uh, the evaluations, they're, they're very often sort of four or five characters, sometimes six, mostly four, if it's elegant. Um, they correspond to what is used to describe calligraphy, painting, and also martial arts. So there seems to be a realm of discourse that is um, um, basically um, made possible by a certain terminology that is applied in some fields of discourse. Other fields of discourse use a different terminology, but we have to try and delineate where there are correspondences, where there's um, resonances between these terminologies and what that actually can tell us about he how people evaluated um, the credibility, the veracity and the validity of claims that are made. And then finally, we, we have to see in which fields these terms are deployed and, and where they are recognized as valid. Now, this is of course not all new. So, so, so I, we don't claim at all that this is a new approach. It has been, uh, I, I think, part of the agenda that, that you know, our elders um, the genius elder, sort of Christoph Habsburg with his language and logic and civilization uh, in science and civilization in China, but also A.C. Graham, of course, in his, his monumental, uh, the magnificent study of the later most logic, ethics and science. Of course, they were also aware that you had to look into 
practices as much as into theory. So, so it's it's not that new, but I, I think sometimes they weren't as systematic. Um, and of course, what they were looking at was basically early Chinese texts, the foundational texts, the classicist um, um, uh, prejudice uh, would be very much alive and kicking there. Other scholars uh, more recently have of course gone beyond that. There's um, a very nice edited volume on literary forms of argument, once again in early China by Joachim Gens and Dirk Meyer, and, um, and some of the people in the audience have contributed to that. Um, Garrett Oberding has done great work on, on, on how facts can be doubted in historiography. He also has an edited volume um, about modes of advice, uh, which very often sort of um, involve some of the things that we are also interested in. But, but once again, sort of they're, they're working mainly on an earlier period of history. And so they have their inspirations to us, but they're not doing exactly what we do. Um, and also, and, and that's one thing where sort of in a historian of late imperial China for once doesn't feel inferior to people doing the early stuff, the hard stuff is, of course, we have a lot more circumstantial evidence than any of these people ever had. So we actually have um, 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 documents that try to present um, testimony in legal cases on a, on a huge scale. Um, we have examination essays and the evaluations of, in the number of millions um, that can be accessed. And Ivo Amlung has looked at, into that together with Wilma Gona. So we have lots of stuff um, that these people working on older periods don't have. And that's an advantage that I think we should be leveraging. Now, um, when we were thinking about doing something like that as a project, um, first we were kind of led astray. And so I also talk about a couple of things that we tried out and that actually backfired and didn't work at all. And one was something when we were still thinking uh, about staying uh, close to logic. And so we thought, how can we expand a little bit our, our reach in looking into Chinese logic uh, more broadly conceived? And there are sort of some texts that we found interesting were something that you, you may know, sort of classics um, in the history of reasoning. Um, uh, uh, Stephen Toulmin wrote this book, I think, in the late 50s. Um, it's now used, I think, in writing classes all over the place, sort of how to make an argument. You present the grounds, you make a claim, you have a warrant, you, you have sort of some additional evidence, you have potential objections, um, and you have a good refutation. So these are ways of, of making arguments that go beyond um, just formal logic, the syllogism and, and other things. And the same is true also for Chaim Perriman. Um, and always Tsitsika, who, who were talking about the new rhetoric. They found different realms in which different arguments um, have a different effect. And, and we thought that it was this would be perhaps a way for us sort of to get a hold of, of what we wanted to look into, namely practices of argumentation without any explicit rules. Um, so we did that for a while. Um, it wasn't very productive, but we thought it would enable us to participate in a larger project that a colleague of mine uh, was running here. Her name is uh, Birgit Kellner who's now in Austria in Vienna. Um, she's a scholar of Tibetan Buddhism and Sanskrit, epistemology and logic. And together with a historian of medieval logic, Sarah Ackelman, who's now in Durham, they had a project that we found fascinating. So they were drawing on dialogical and dynamic um, logic in order to model earlier forms of logical reasoning. Sarah Ackelman uh, wrote a very nice dissertation on the obligationes logic in, in the Middle Ages. And she, she did lots of um, uh, computerized uh, analysis of how what, what they called reason maintenance um, is warranted. And then we thought, so uh, Birgit Kenner applied that to Tibetan texts and, and also to some Sanskrit texts that, that she knew from a Buddhist practice and, and compiled similar models. And, and we thought, you know, why not join this effort? You know, go with the stuff that we have learned uh, about Chinese logic and, and join the fold and become sort of digital heroes um, of reason maintenance mechanisms also in China. Um, th that failed miserably because for all these exercises that they were doing, you need some modicum of explicit rules that you presuppose. And once they have these explicit rules, they can see whether these rules are actually applied in reasoning. What they cannot or what they could not do when we were working together with them was what we were hoping for, that they actually looked into the practices and then could tell us the implicit rules. This, and it's not their fault, um, <laughs> this uh, apparently um, was not possible. So, so we wasted sort of a, a, a good year um, uh, trying to make sense of these things um, uh, and didn't go anywhere. Um, and so we stopped that. It may be that perhaps other people have better ideas on how to do that. But for us, um, we always sort of uh, failed to provide anything that was firm enough as a rule to be guiding 
these analyses that they wanted to do. So it didn't work, but maybe it can um, in the future. Now, then instead, we, we sort of, we turned around and said, okay, we look into more recent things and, and stuff that goes below, beyond logic more. Then one of the um, inspiration that many of, it's, it's a book that every one of you should read at some point in their lives, um, it, it is a collection of essays that came out first in Chinese, and there's a couple more essays in the Chinese um, edition. So, so look at that first, um, edited by, by Xiong Mingzhen, Charlotte First, the late Charlotte First, mm -hmm. uh, and Judith Steitlin. And it's about how to make evidence speak. So, um, and in the Western um, um, edition, it's more about thinking with cases, looking into individual cases of, of reasoning and how they actually work, how evidence is made possible. And we found that um, a, a brilliant inspiration and, and sort of um, tried to run with it when we um, compiled a volume on our own. Um, that's, that's this one with Martin Hofmann uh, and Ari Levine, where we try to look into various fields of discourse and try to extract the implicit um, standards of validity, the implicit rules that were validating, that were used to validate certain arguments or not. And I, I just give you some examples of the types of fields in which we want to look um, and what our authors then uh, try to do. Um, so one is the analysis of examination essays. And I still think that should be done. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at Ivo Amlung, who has to do that at some point with Rui Magoni. So there's so many examination essays. And what we need to do, what we need to understand, Uli at Williams College is also working on that and has written a, a couple of pieces on it is we actually have to understand what the Baguen was. I mean, you all know, you're all familiar that Hu Shi says it's gymnastics that keeps uh, that kept Chinese scholars from thinking straight for 300 years. Um, Yen Fu said it was a prison that basically <laughs> made us impotent uh, to become modern scientists. And so, so we have a lot of propaganda, but when the Baguen was, was introduced, as you all know, when it was the, 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 the writing of the times, it was actually seen as the most flexible device to make an argument. And no matter how you, how you look at it, um, what we what we can diagnose very easily is that Bhagavan is everywhere. So so when you read novels from the Ming and the and the and, and the Qing, um, formulations that remind you of the Bhagavan are everywhere, and it goes into the um, beginning of the um, 20th century. So so one very good example that I like is that Liu Shipei, who at some point became an anarchist. You know, writes a, 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 an embrace of anarchist um, theories of how to overturn the state and of e equality between the sexes, and he writes that in in a type of style that is reminiscent of the Bhagavan in Pianwan, in in parallel prose. And so the Bhagavan is everywhere. So it it is the way uh, many many people started to learn to argue because they had to write so many of them. So we have to understand the form, formal requirements. We have to get a better understanding uh, of the rhetorics of the Bhagavan. And of course, we have to try and understand what the standards for judging them were. It was not all about, you know, pleasing ideologically um, your first examiner. It was, a, 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 to a great deal, it was based on um, on forms, on, on formal abilities that you needed to have, um, in, of arguments you needed to make. Um, and so if we were able to recover all these standards of judgment, that you know, people had to believe in, otherwise they would never participate in this thing. Um, that would, would help us. And of course, we also have to look into the didactic practices. Now, some of them has some of this has been done. Um, there's a great new book, by, by, a recent book by Alexander Deforge, and Alexander Deforge and Rui Magona are also working on a collection on the Bagu one that will sort of have some parts that are relevant to our agenda of standards of validity. Uli will have an, an essay there. In, in Benjamin Elman's book, you don't find so much other than kind of the emphasis, how important the Bago one was. And I think that's also um, something that needs to be done in the future. I have not been able to do it, but someone has to do it uh, at some point. Um, a second field of inquiry that I think um, merits a great deal more attention um, is philology as critique. So we, we need to understand better the critical vocabulary that is used in interlinear commentary. So people were fighting about interpretations of individual signs, uh, of individual characters, uh, of, of sentences, um, of, of um, entire philosophical approaches in interlinear commentary, and they had a language of evaluation. Um, they had a language in which they justified emendations and glosses or, or critique that um, uh, of their neighbors. Uh, there's also, and that's something that, that Martin Hofmann, my, my office neighbor, has worked on, um, namely the use of, of diagrams, of cartography, of maps, 
um, and, and Michael Lackner has also written on that, of, of, of visual um, evidence to make, um, basically to, to contradict uh, interpretation of the classics um, in, in the linear textual form. So, so that is very important. The persuasive strategies that are used, not only in the whole when sort of in the question and answer genre, but also in other genres would also be, I think, worthwhile looking into. And, and then, of course, the rhetorical conventions of contention, sort of how nasty can you be when you want to contradict someone who has been very famous and, and considered to be orthodox for a while? Um, how far can you go? So that, that's another thing. And we have some essays also um, in, in this volume, and we will want to um, continue that. Um, third field, I, I have five fields, and then I come to my case studies, or maybe I have six, um, uh, is historical analogy. So historical analogy is a, is a, is a very interesting theme. Um, Ari Levine has uh, mostly worked on, on that. Um, and he was basically um, contradicting Robert Hartwell, who said historical analogies in China are everywhere, and it's a deficient form of social sciences. So the Chinese never understood what social sciences were, and instead they had historical analogism. Um, and I think what, what Ari and, and Peter Dittmanson and a couple of other people have also shown is that the historical analogies are used in, in much more complex ways. Um, but we still don't know exactly. I mean, Ari has worked on the Sung, so the, the late Northern Sung, so he has an idea of what, what happened there. But in larger um, context, we don't exactly know why specific, um, why specific analogies were considered to be so powerful over a longer period of time and where others um, were judged to be more um, experimental and perhaps not so convincing. And yet some people made these lesser known analogies in order to make points. So we have to look into that. We also have to look then into the use of moral exemplars, sort of, of moral exemplars that are um, part of these analogies and said, well, we have, should all behave like X or we should emulate um, the actions of a certain king. Um, and then if we were really game, we could also think of typologies of events and, and criteria for inclusion and exclusion in these analogies. So, so is only war important? Is only, uh, are only benev benevolent acts by, by um, uh, by rulers um, to be their courageous um, um, courageous um, acts by by advisors, or what can we look at? So this would be something that I think would also be um, very fruitful um, in the long run. Um, the reason why I thought I had five fields of inquiry and not six is that I used the number three twice. So the fourth field of inquiry, sorry, um, is something um, where sort of people um, like myself sort of who have worked on, on European Chinese um, interactions for a long time, uh, delighted um, to find some examples of, of actual arguments, namely um, religious debates between Buddhists and Christians. Um, we have some examples uh, from that. Um, here you, you see um, Jiang Wu has, has written a, a book about that. Um, so we have Ou Yi Zhi um, and Fei Ying Tongrong. Um, you have these two, uh, two sites. And what's interesting about that, that they conducted um, um, debates with Christians. Um, they used Buddhist rules of reasoning. The Christians used um, the Aristotelian syllogism. Both were completely convinced that they were right. Um, and, and that led to nothing. But it's exceedingly important for us sort of to see how they use the rules, what they made of the rules of the other. And so therefore, oops, uh, therefore, um, I, I think it can be very, very helpful to um, look into these debates uh, a bit more, especially into OE Jewish use um, uh, stuff that we have here. Um, all right, so religious debates, if any one of you is up for that, um, then um, more history of science stuff. Um, some of you are interested in that. Uh, I think calendrical studies are, of course, uh, very, very important. We have information about the calendar case, about various disputes between um, different factions in, in the Imperial Office of Astronomy. Uh, we can look into these arguments. Zhu Ping Yi has done some of that. Katrin Jami has done some of that uh, and other people. Um, and what's interesting there is not only how they make the arguments, but also how they use calculations, verification, and proof to persuade the other side and also to persuade the emperor. So that's a more natural science -y way of doing it, but I think it's important to reconstruct these um, um, cultures of reasoning that we have in calendrical studies. Related to that, of course, uh, is mathematics. Um, and as some of you are aware, uh, my colleague Andrea Briar sort of has a huge project on the use of numbers and quantification. Um, uh, also to make arguments throughout Chinese history. So what she wants to look at, and, and Karin Chamla will do that next week, I believe, or the week after also, are forms, techniques, and uses of demonstration, different ways of proof. Um, they will also look into the epistemic ideals that are underlying many of these uh, forms of demonstration, like simplicity, coherence, um, and, and others. And finally, it might be worthwhile to look into the argumentative use of numbers. So what can you do with a number that you cannot do with a text?
So not only linear text um, and images, but also linear text um, and numbers are something that one could look into. And we, we have some um, essays on that in our collection. Then finally, um, law is of course a, a very rewarding field uh, because there in, in the language of the legal codes, you find a lot about veracity, about credibility, uh, about um, trustworthiness, uh, about contradictions. Um, and also they lay down um, the codes by themselves, the criteria of clarity, of coherence, of exhaustiveness, applicability, um, and others. So the language of the law is clearly one in which um, the argument plays a central role because you have to justify any verdict that you do um, and it's sent, you know, it's sent on to a higher power. So somehow it has to withstand scrutiny. And very often we have uh, evidence of cases that were overturned. And so there we can also look um, on the grounds and why they were overturned. This will then give us, I, I think, um, criteria for the evaluation of evidence, um, for the evaluation of oral testimony, as I said before, and we can also look into the rhetoric of justification of these verdicts. Um, Matthew, Matthew Sommer has done some um, work in that regard. Um, Cho Pong Sheng has done brilliant work, um, first at the Academia Sinica and then in Hong Kong, um, and, and there's also a lot of other stuff, also a collection by Robert Hegel that I will mention later on writing the law um, and literature in, in late imperial China. Now, these are all I, I think um, fields of inquiry that still have a lot um, um, to mine for. So there's still a lot to learn from all these um, um, these fields. Um, but I will use the remainder of my talk not to look into these fields, but to look into something that I've become interested sort of in the last year and a half or so that I think is perhaps even more rewarding for someone interested in cultures of reasoning, namely um, the art of deception and trickery. Um, and other things. Um, it started, I became interested in that when, when I was rereading a book that was written in the 1930s. And I don't know if anyone ever heard of that. Um, it, it was re-edited in a beautiful edition in Germany sort of some years ago. And it's called The Power of the Charlatan or Die Macht des Charlatan. Uh, it was written by um, um, a female scholar, Greta de Francesco, which is a pseudonym uh, of Greta Weisenstein. She, she wrote a, a, an art historical book on the cover of it about the power of the charlatan in, in the mid-1930s. It came out in 1937. And of course, it's, it's what it really is, it's a veiled critique um, of the Nazis and of Hitler and his power. Um, and, and I knew that when I opened the book. Um, so, of course, the first time you read it, you think, okay, this, this is a, a brilliant and, and, and very learned critique and, 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 and such a, a pointed critique of what the Nazis were doing. But then uh, the more you read it, it's also great because it tells you about other charlatans. So she has all these um, um, depictions of charlatans, especially in visual culture, but also in literature um, and everywhere, also the dialogues. And so she, she analyzes what charlatans can do. And from that, she depicts what charlatans were expecting their audiences to expect. So in order to really be able to trick them, to deceive them, they had to know their epistemic ideals, their expectations of what good evidence is, what makes a valid argument. And so looking into the skills of charlatans gives you a great idea of what actually happened in society, of what they were accept, uh, expecting in society. And I thought that is something that we may also apply then and, and try out in China. Um, the, the two um, areas in which I want to do that, um, and, and here's great um, stories on that, of course, is quacks, um, sort of medical charlatans, that the traveling doctors, healers, um, that always have to sell their skills and have to um, make great rhetorical efforts to sell their skills and make sure that their patients remain convinced after they don't get better. Um, and, and so there's uh, strategies for that. Um, so, so, so medicine is, is one realm of which I'm blissfully unaware, as I said before, but I tried to look into it a, a little bit. The other one is the law. Um, and in the law, um, of course, we know that lawyers sort of make any argument. And, and of course, in Chinese history, we have Deng Xi, the guy who could sell his um, services to both sides because he could win any case um, for this side or for that side because he was so good in argumentation. Um, this was something that I, I had always tried to look into, but then I, I got distracted again by another book uh, by Graham Jones, who's an anthropologist, a contemporary anthropologist, who has a book called Trade of the Tricks Inside the Magician's Craft. And what he did for that is um, he became a magician in Paris and went through the school of magic. And there's, there's a guild of magicians um, in which it is very hard to, to be accepted. Um, you have to be able to perform tricks. You have to be able to pass tricks on. You have to be able to guess tricks. And it takes a couple of years to go through this apprenticeship. And he wrote this book about the trade of the tricks, which I also found very, very inspiring because it also tells you he's always trying to understand what they expect from him and what they think 
their audience will expect. So what makes a good trick uh, for a magician is something that's exceedingly skillful in the uses of evidence in order to deceive the expectations of the audience. So, so once again, it gives us a very sharp insight into um, what people expect, what the actually socially intersubjectively shared um, norms um, uh, uh, for the use of evidence and for the making of arguments might be. So, so this was kind of the theoretical background on, on, the, on the Western side that I read in the background. Greta de Francesco is a book that really everyone should read at some point. It's, it's a real fun story. Um, and, and even if you, could, if you can't stand Hitler, it's, it's a great way of, of getting to know him um, and his tricks. Anyway, of course, in China, things happen too. So, so we have books like the Book of Swindles, uh, translated um, by, by Bruce Rusk um, and, and Christopher Rea some, some years back. And Bruce Rusk, of course, is someone who has been working on, on forgeries and, and fakes and other things in the Ming Dynasty. The, the book, I think, is still not out, but it's coming, it's coming. Um, it was his dissertation and will come out at some point. Um, so there's also a, a lot of stuff that you, you can uh, mine. Now, to, to put all that into a, a program of research, um, this is what I thought. So um, why deception is important for our understanding of reasoning and validation is the following. Um, trust in the credibility of actors and the validation of knowledge claims depend on intersubjectively shared and socially recognized values and habits. That's pretty much what I just said. So in order to be able to sell your tricks, you have to meet people where they are. Um, these values are rarely explicitly codified, but more often embodied in discursive evidentiary practices. And this is what kind of um, cracks uh, and magicians play with. For subaltern actors in particular, it is very important to develop versatile strategies to convince potential clients of the efficacy of their services and products persuade them of their competitive advantages over the quack next door and dispel doubts about their abilities and intentions. So for them, the argumentative effort and the evidentiary effort might be even more. You know, if you're um, someone who's certified by the imperial institution, if you're a, a full professor, you know, whatever bullshit you say, um, people will lend credibility to more easily than to some guy who just happened randomly to walk into a bar and make a claim. So clearly they have to work harder and that makes them interesting. And then um, I, I, I do a justification why medicine and law um, are, are so important, because in both fields, uh, actually, truth matters. If you actually have a cure or you don't, and if you, or whether you can actually win a case or not, has potentially deadly consequences. So there, it's even more important sort of to be right and to, to gain credibility. And then what I think we can do from um, looking into these conscious strategies of deception can provide insights into the epistemic values social actors assume to be shared by their target audience. They may not have shared them themselves because they were lying all the time, but at least they felt the need to meet them performatively in order to make their claims acceptable. So, so I thought it's a good idea to look into these practices. I'll start with law um, um, and look into some um, tricks of litigation masters. And then I, I look into um, building on the work of Paul Unschuld, who has a collection of, of these texts uh, on texts on quacks, how to deceive their public. And I think they're interesting, they may be interesting for us. Now, um, in Chinese law, uh, what is most important for us is litigation culture. Um, we all know that litigation is a bad thing. Every good con confusion knows that the best county is the one in which no legal cases um, need to be ruled because the people all live in harmony and peace. Um, but contrary to uh, that assumption, um, especially late imperial China was a terribly litigious culture. So litigation was everywhere. People went to court with the yamen with the, the, the most minute worries and grievances they held against their neighbors, um, tried to submit um, a, a file, get it accepted and get someone else punished, um, which put an enormous workload on the magistrate. We, we know that some larger counties had to process up to 10,000 10, um, complaints a month. Um, and that is after they were filtered. So, so it's an enormous mass uh, of doing that. And, and therefore, uh, it was exceedingly important to write a good first complaint like the good Baguen, you know, if the first sentence doesn't really sound right, it will be rejected instantly. Um, a lot of people have worked on that recently. Um, I, I mentioned Robert Hegel and, and Catherine Karnitz, who have this uh, really very, very readable uh, collection of writing and law in late imperial China, but also then Mark McNicholas' book on forgery and impersonation includes a lot of things um, that are actually uh, interesting. We know more about the litigation masters through the work uh, of Melissa McCauley, of course, that everyone knows. Um, in China, and I didn't find the, the cover image, so otherwise I would have shown you, there's Yo Chen Jun, Yo Chen Jun in Beijing, who, ha who has two books on, on litigation culture and also on, on litigation narratives, um, which I found very inspiring to read. Um, so, so what I try to do is sort of to try and understand what a complaint really is. Um, in, in order to do that, um, an easy starting point for someone who's not a, an expert in legal history 
is um, uh, the Fu Hui Quan Shu, of course, um, a, a manual that you all know. It's been conveniently translated into English um, as a complete book concerning happiness and benevolence. And there too, we, we find an effort by the magistrate. So it's a, a handbook for magistrates to reduce the numbers of complaints that he has to process and make sure that no one falls for that. Um, so he provides a, a complaint form um, and it looks as follows. So the plaintiff X is filing a complaint in the following matter. Then you describe it briefly and you have about 140 characters. Wang Yohong says 140 characters, not much. Maybe up to 300 if you're really daring, but more than 300 and you're out. Then you have to have um, um, a lot of information. You have the defendant, you have witnesses, neighbors, the place where everything happened, um, uh, the date when um, the complaint was filed. Uh, and then there's sort of two people uh, where litigation masters can come in. There's an authorized representative, usually not a litigation master, but a clerk at the Yaman. But very often these clerks were in cahoots with litigation masters, um, uh, or at least this was claimed by Huang Liuhong. Um, and there's also public writers who help people to write up their complaints. And very often they also knew some tricks on how to make um, um, the complaint heard um, and the date of submission. Now, of course, from the magistrate's point of view, litigation masters, which were outlawed, uh, were just troublemakers. Um, they called them sung gun. So, so like Yago, like, like hooligans, uh, basically litigation hooligans or, or, or something like that. But, but for uh, the common people, litigation masters actually presented a lot of hope. Um, and we know that that even in Peking Opera, uh, very often we would have litigation masters who defend the powerless somehow, who defend them uh, against corrupt officials, against ignorant officials, and, and basically uh, against the, the random cruelty um, of the state. So, so there is a broad span of activities that we have, um, and that makes it interesting. So uh, just to give you um, an idea of the um, image of the litigation master uh, from Huang Liuhong's book again, he says, there are litigation instigators or rowdies whose hearts resemble those of tigers and wolves and whose actions can be compared to goblins and demons. They have no permanent occupation. Their only profession is assisting others in drawing up legal papers. As soon as a complaint is filed, they use their caustic and irrational writings to twist things around and make devious arrangements for their clients. That's interesting for us. They, they twist things around. They have caustic and irrational writings. Um, and of course, then what um, a litigation master has to try is to convince the magistrate that he's not a caustic writer and he's not an irrational writer. So he has to put great effort into making his um, complaint or the complaint of his clients sound good. Now, many, people, many stupid people become victims of the, uh, the swindles of these litigation hooligans and lose large sums of money. These rascals then divide the loot among themselves. Many even play a double game by extorting money from both the defendant and the plaintiff. So that's the, the common um, um, denigration of the litigation masters. Um, now, um, of course, then the magistrate's um, 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 duty is to, to, to try and chase them away, to make sure that they, they cannot be successful in um, multiplying the number of complaints that are filed and make sure that no one is cheated out of that. Good. So that's the official point of view. Now, in response to that, um, litigation masters try to perfect their skills. And, and there's a trove of, of, of documents that, of course, legal historians all know. Um, um, uh, Fuma Susumo in, in Japan has written uh, brilliantly about this whole uh, set of books that, they, that he called the Song Shi Miben, so the secret manuals of litigation masters. Um, and, and we have a trove of, of around 50 of these books that survive from the Qing dynasty where sort of um, litigation masters, um, of course, always posing as just um, good assistants of, of the imperial dynasty and the moral precepts um, that you have in the sacred edicts, um, um, try to teach their craft, how you become a good litigation master. And, and these are interesting. These are gold for someone who's interested in, in argumentative theory, I would say. Um, uh, one book I've read a, a bit um, lately is this one, Xiao and Cao's um, Manual to Assist the Ruler. The, the Xiao Cao uh, Zhu Jun Shu, um, um, that actually sort of has a list that is reproduced very, very often, even in Wang Bao Chan Shu and many other things, uh, and many other books, on how to actually write a good complaint. Um, it starts out with a list of 10 things that you have to absolutely avoid, resolutely avoid. So you have to avoid confusion and lack of clarity. You have to uh, avoid, sorry, over complexity and disorder. Sorry for the typo. You have to... Uh, that's another one that's in German. So you have to not refer <laughs> to witnesses that are absurd and don't make sense. So don't call in people who are not relevant to the case. You have to avoid ruptures and digressions in your writing. You have to avoid the misuse of terms, especially legal terms. You have to avoid to omit 
conclusions, to not draw a conclusion from what you say in the case. You have to avoid deviating from the spirit of the law. So it ha always has to resonate with what the spirit of the law might be, and you have to know what that is. You have to avoid to report without urgency. You have to make clear that this is not a trifle. It's actually an urgent matter for the um, the order and 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 uh, the situation in the in the county where you uh, file your report. You have to avoid uh, just to offer a collection of trifles, and you have to avoid and make sure that you don't do baseless accusations. Now, if you turn that around, and that's the whole point of um, studying these texts, you know what a good um, 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 plaint would look like. It would be clear. It would be very well ordered, um, um, brilliantly structured. It would only point to witnesses that actually matter. It would have no digressions, but stick to the message. It would um, use terms um, beautifully um, and knowledgeably. Uh, it would always draw conclusions and just help the magistrate to actually identify the statute under which he should um, then judge a certain uh, case. Um, he should know the spirit of the laws. He should know what's an urgent case. He should avoid trifles and, and uh, know um, what it is. To make an, um, an accusation. So, so that's not too bad. That gives us already an idea of the epistemic ideals and of the, of the rhetorical conventions that we need in writing. Um, but then there's another um, structural thing that you can learn by heart, and it's called the wonderful structure of the 10 sections of brocade, the shiduan. Um, so you have 10 sections. Um, and, and the idea is that in filing a complaint, you have 300 characters to do so, um, you should follow this structure. Um, so you should start with a theme in one sentence, you have to say, this is the subject of the complaint. This is what it's all about. Then you have to say, well, this is my evidence that I have. These are the grounds for my complaint. And this is the origin or the nature of the evidence. It's either eyewitness accounts or I have something in my hand that I can do. Then you have to do, you have to date it and you have to give a chronology. And then in a fourth step, once you did that, so the case is outlined at the beginning, then you have to kind of evaluate or, or give a, your assessment of the evidence. This is, in your view, overwhelming evidence that something like that happens. Once you did that, you have to say, because I have this evidence, I can reconstruct the event. You have to do it. You have to reconstruct um, the event. Um, and that is the moment of success or failure, right in the middle uh, of this structure. Um, if your evidence is robust enough and enough to counter uh, to overrule counter evidence, then this determines your gain of loss. And you have to spell that out and say, well, my evidence is stronger than the other evidence. Uh, then if someone made um, has a different account, if there's witnesses, you have to assess them, um, basically refute your opponents. Um, uh, and then that's, that's, that's the final section. First, you have to draw conclusions from the legal statutes. So you have to say, because this violates statute X, therefore, I demand, and that's the outcome, um, the following verdict. And that's great because you basically, and you make the magistrate's uh, work easy. You give him the statute, you give him the verdict, and you spell it out for him. And then towards the end, you make a, a declaration, sort of um, something, a, a nice concluding, a flowery con uh, statement that shows your own sincerity and respect for the magistrate and also tells, tells you what's in it for him. Now, we, we have this, and, and what's interesting is, so, so these are the, the guidelines. And of course, you would think, um, well, of course, they don't reflect what's actually happening. Um, they do not always reflect what you're happening, but in many cases, they actually do. And, and, and so I thought, and I wonder, Henry, you have to tell me when, when we are running out of time. I would have one case that we could go through um, briefly to see how that works. And it's not it's not an actual case. So it's, it's from a collection. I, I apologize for the bad cover. It, it's a collection that was um, done in the uh, Republican period called Er Sung Shi. So it's about evil pettifoggers, about evil litigation masters. And it, it, it's full um, uh, of, of different events like the following. So, so here's my case. Villager A wanted to slander B out of revenge because he hated him. Not knowing how to go about it, he turned to litigation master Yang Se Yen, who was a show tie but then didn't get a job. Yang ordered A to first report a theft and make a list of stolen items, which included gold, pearls, and jewelry worth of less of no less than 1,000 pieces of gold, so something really, really substantial. After the loss had been reported to the official authorities, A was to instruct someone to sell B a vase of chrysanthemums from his own possessions that was on the list. So clearly, Young set up B to be caught as a thief, red-handed, um, through this trick. Um, and here's the complaint that Young then drew up on behalf of his client. So the theme is somehow flowery. It says, catching thieves by finding stolen goods. 
you know, it's a four character thing and I apologize not for having included all, um, all, all of the Chinese. So that's the theme. Then you do something to entice the magistrate to read on. Exotic flowers and rare herbs. Although some things seem trivial and small, if you trace them to their origins, they can serve as circumstantial evidence in legal cases. So you show your own erudition, so you're not just anyone, you're someone who appreciates flowers and rare herbs, um, but there's a legal significance to it. So the magistrate might be swayed. Then you set the time. On the first day of the month, gold, silver, and jewelry worth about a thousand pieces of gold were stolen from my household. I immediately drew up a list and reported the loss. After a month, the circumstances were still in the dark. Um, Okay, the timing is there. Then the evaluation. The day before yesterday evening, I was passing the gate of B's house and happened to see a vase of chrysanthemums, which had also been in my possession in the past and had been stolen from me together with the gold, pearls, and jewelry. So there you say, I have a piece of incontrovertible evidence because it's my own eyewitness account. I saw it. Although the value of the chrysanthemum vase is low, this vase is made of antique chayao porcelain, an exquisite material crafted in a delicate style. How could such an object be a common piece? Mainly, I know this is my piece. This is not any old vase. I know it's exactly my vase because I'm the only one around here who owned a Taiyo vase. Very important, so to, to strengthen your evidence. You go on and say, I immediately confronted landlord B and asked him where he had got the vase. B began to stammer and became very agitated. At one point, he claimed that he had bought the vase in Shenjiang, then that it had been given to him by friends. What he said was confused and made him suspicious. After I questioned him again and again, he bowed his head and fell silent. So you show that you can actually overrule by your own conclusions um, uh, the defendant. Then you say, since the chrysanthemums were in his house, I believe that the other things will also turn up there. That would save the magistrate a search of the house. You just say, um, I have very strong evidence. So it's, it's just something that you suggest to him. Um, now the summary, very, very important, and the application to the statute. Even if B did not steal the things himself, he's guilty of the crime of keeping stolen goods, however often he may deny it. Okay, that's the, that's the, the statute that you have. I therefore respectfully request that proceedings be instituted and that the matter be rigorously in, investigated. Tracking down the loot and applying the statute on keeping stolen goods is the way to end the crime of theft. That's the outcome. It's an outcome not only for yourself, but also for the magistrate, because you end the crime of theft in his county. And then the declaration towards the end of your goodwill, only when the stolen property is back in the hands of its rightful owner, will the people of the district be able to sleep peacefully again. I appeal with the greatest urgency to the authorities to admit the complaint. So this is one example of a capable evil litigation master who can write very well, uh, present the facts very well after he had himself manipulated the case in a manner and, and you know basically set up a trap for poor villager B who was hated by villager A. Um, for us, it's interesting how he fills these, uh, this structure, the 10 sections of brocade, and how he uses them very, very um, skillfully to provide incontrovertible evidence. Of course, there's some holes in it. You know, I believe that the other things will also turn up there. But he says, I believe. He doesn't make any claims, any baseless accusations. So he doesn't, viol uh, he doesn't um, violate any of the 10 rules that we looked at before. And so what, what I would hope to do in the future is sort of to look into many, many more of these cases, not only fictive case, fictitious cases um, in Republican period um, documents, but, but also sort of in, in earlier actual legal cases and see how that works. And then um, um, it would be interesting also sort of to compare the ways of writings by litigation masters with the official ways of writing a document. Um, so, so one book that I found helpful there is, uh, is Wang Youhui's Banan Yao Lue. So it's um, a handbook, a manual on the essentials um, uh, of the administration of legal cases for the magistrate. How do you do that? Um, and that's about how the officials are supposed to write their reports when reporting a verdict upwards to the next um, level of the administration. And there we find very similar epistemic ideals. So you put things in good order, you're consistent, you're also comprehensive. You always foreshadow something and then you, you later mention it. Whatever is not later mentioned, you, you cannot foreshadow. You highlight the key points and make meaningful transitions. So you do a lot of signposting so that no one gets lost and can, has easy reading. You summarize points and add supplementary accounts. So you provide the evidence and you write with skill um, to lay out the story. So you also try to charm a little bit your reader and not bore him. Um, uh, too much. And it would be great at some point if we had sort of a larger repository of these cases. And, and since Pierre Tienville has this marvelous database of administrative manuals, um, we will probably be able to find quite a few. Um, then I think that would be good to reconstruct the culture of legal reasoning 
that we have. Now I'm I'm realized I, I'm already over time, but I no not over time yet, but soon I'm over time. But I still want to look into um, the other area, namely the quacks. So th th there's a lot of books um, uh, on quacks. Uh, Andy Schoenbaum's uh, recent novel Medicine is is one trope, but there's also a lot of other things. So I don't have to you know, remind you of that. Most of you will know that better than me. Um, anyway, just briefly of who these quacks are. And they have different names. They're called itinerant physicians, xing yi. Um, sometimes they, they're also called um, ling yi. So the, the bell doctors, because they, they entered the village with a bell on their hands. Um, so they made some noise in order to attract attention. Um, and through that, they are very similar um, to also European quacks who made similar um, um, staged um, uh, appearances uh, wherever they went. Um, uh, we have um, here sort of, the, this is um, a painting in, in a missionary journal. Um, of an of a singi of an itinerant itinerant uh, physician with his helpers uh, in Tianjin from 1858, and there you see um, so the, the the physician is standing holding up the snake and some medicine in his hand. Then there's a couple of other things who entertain the crowd. Some people who go about um, selling little powders. Um, there may also be some pickpockets there. So so it's a it's a, a scene of mayhem um, that we have. And of course you could say, well, that's once again the authorities looking um, down on these. Um, um, actually socially very, very um, um, useful doctors because many people couldn't afford anything else. And I, and I agree to that. On the other hand, there is some examples where actually itinerant physicians were consciously cheating. And we're talking about that. Um, and Paul Unschul has, has one little essay where, where he talks about that. And, and he found um, a good material that I think is, is, is brilliant uh, for other people to work with. One is he found um, a, a book, a vocabulary um, of itinerant, not only um, physicians, but also traders. And he found that they basically have a vocabulary that can um, help you um, to understand the choreography of deception when they entered a village. So when you enter a village, you go in, the first thing you do is you have to gather people around you to, you know, to make them weiguan, form a circle and stare. And you do that, they call it, you glue a circle. Once you have that circle there, and it's pretty much what every teacher does in class, you pick out one person that you think might be most amenable somehow, someone who blinked or, or whatever. You pick them out. That's called pick a card. Then the show begins. You loosen the glue means you kind of you only talk to that one person. You loosen the glue of, of, of the whole circle um, in order to make them in order to make them swallow, to, to, to bite. So you do something. You say, your man there, your eye looks really red. There must be something wrong with it. Maybe you have a cataract or something. Um, so you pick that person out. Um, then you perform your skills um, as a doctor. So they call it, you paste the string. You feel the pulse or you do something, something medical. Um, then you, you have to, to wave out more. You, you have to somehow um, close the deal. So you have to say, okay, here I have a diagnosis. I know your eyes are red. There's something wrong with it. I felt your pulse. Um, but I would have something that I can sell you. So to push them to bite. Once you do that, you present them with more um, incontrovertible evidence. And he calls that the devil sticks a leg in. So you push them really to buy. Then when they're still hesitant, you split the thunder, meaning you swear a lot, a lot of oaths. You say, well, you know, I will be damned. Um, if, you know, my mother will die tomorrow um, if you don't buy this thing. And then finally, very important, la homer. So, so you kind of, you shut the back door, you, you make a quick exit so that no one can, can actually catch you. So that's the choreography uh, of deception. And, and what's interesting is that, that we have certain um, texts that actually, and I talk about the other quote in a moment, um, that actually make use of similar choreographies. Um, so Unschuld himself in, in his marvelous collection, and much of it is digitized now. So for people who are not close to Berlin, um, look at the uh, Staatsbibliothek, the, the National Library in, in Berlin and, and the, the Unschuld collection. And here's a couple of books that quacks wrote in order to instruct their offspring on how to be a good quack and not be caught. Um, one is this one, Zhang uh, Wenhui's Yao Zhi. So what itinerant physicians need to know uh, and it looks like that, so, so it's um, handwritten. Um, and, and I want to talk about um, two um, little paragraphs here. So uh, one on the right-hand side, there's something, Yong Hong Xi Gua, it starts. You see that sort of in the middle of the page. I, I, I don't have a pointer, so I can't show you. So there's two paragraphs. One is the Yong Hong Xi Gua, and the other one is Yong Ji Yu, sort of, um, uh, and I, I'll, I'll just translate them for you. So here's the first trick, um, the watermelon trick. Um, what you do is you dry pulp from red watermelon in the sun and you grind it to a fine powder. Save and store it for later use. Later use is when you go to the village. When the time comes to use it, 
um, drop it with cold water into the patient's eye. So you pick the one guy out, you have a bit of water on your hands and some of this powder and you stick it into the person's eye. So you, you know, put it there somehow while you're performing and while everyone's kind of distracted by all the other things that are going on. A moment later, shout that hot tears will start to flow, namely when the pulp, the powdered pulp will expand in the water. So there will be red stuff coming out of the eye. Remove the diluted pulp from the eye, like that, um, like threads of red blood. They don't look phony at all. So that's where you can establish that your patient definitely has a problem, right? So, so you insert it yourself, but if you're, if you're skillful, no one will know. And of course, then you can sell them all sorts of powders that will make his eyes better at some point, um, if all works well. The, the second one is similar. Um, and, and it's about uh, the G, I, I don't know, it's some kind of carp. Um, so you, what you do is you dry some scales of that carp in the sun, you save and store them for later use. We heard that before. When the time comes to use them, you use your subtle skills of your hand to insert one scale with some eye drops. So you have to put some eye drops on your finger and a scale, and you insert it into the patient's eye. Wait a moment until hot tears will gather in the eye to flush out the scale. Catch it with your hand, and it will look as if you removed a dark cloud from the eye. So as if you cured uh, the patient. And then you can show the scale and say, look, this is what I took out of his eye. So clearly, this is all about deception. And, and you will say, OK, this has nothing to do with logic. That's just the performative aspect of it. Right. That's true. And yet what they always insist on is that when you sell drugs or you tell fortunes or do, do other tricks, what really counts is talk. This is what it's really about. And, and what's um, interesting about these books that we have, and I'll, that's really the last thing I want to say, <laughs> is that they also teach you how to talk. So there's certain rhetorical formula that are um, um, in this book uh, to Oh, also in, in another one, so sorry, this is from, from another one, which we also uh, talked about, where you have certain formula that you can use. Um, and these are still kind of rather um, comprehensible, uh, rational. So you say treating diseases with these medicines is like pushing the clouds aside to let the sunshine in. When these remedies reach the site of the disease, they are able to effect a complete cure. This takes at most 10 days, but at least six or seven days. You can count yourself lucky that you have met me. So buy this stuff. It will cure you, but only in six or seven days, meaning when I'm long away from the village. So these are formula stock phrases that you need to use. So, so you make promises, but you make promises in a distance. In six or seven days, you're you know far away. No one can catch you. One thing. So that's a cl classical example of the la homer, uh, of the sort of put, shutting, not opening, shutting um, the back door. Or you say something like this, when blood and chi do not circulate in their usual vessels, this causes serious diseases. Now your abdomen hurts and you have a cough. Should you be hit by cold chi, it won't be easy to cure in your illness. This is gibberish. I mean, they don't know. It's not about medical expertise or anything. It sounds like medical expertise, but it's not, you know, it doesn't make any sense. It's just a one phrase you can use to make them swallow, to make them bite. Um, when I cure a disease, I'm different from other people. I demand payment on the basis of medicinal drugs. If you're not treated now, and if you wait until your illness has worsened, then any remorse will come too late. Another good stock phrase. You say, you know, buy now or you're dead. Um, so you have, you have to do that. So that's pushing him. And then finally, when you negotiate prices, you also say, well, you're rich because you're alive. You're not alive because you're rich. You can only enjoy your wealth as long as you are alive. So these are stock formula. Um, and rhetorically, they've, they've also set up very, very um, cleverly. What I found even more interesting is, though, there's, there's a whole page full of, of sound bites. Things that don't make any sense, but they sound like medicine. You know, an eye disease that will make you blind is what you have. You have a lack of period fluid. Your liver and lung are burnt dry. You should avoid excessive sex, else your eyes will soon no longer see the light. And then it, it cites the naging, and it has all sort of, you know, just gibberish that sounds like medical doctors would possibly speak. But they just have a list of those. So, so this is what you can use to basically distract um, somehow fool um, your audience uh, and, and do that. So, so once again, I think um, what would be good from, for our understanding of how cultural, cultures of reasoning work would be to look into more of these examples, um, make an inventory of the, um, the techniques they, they use, look into the, the most um, important for them, most important evidential, evidential practices and also um, epistemic ideals that they want to play to, uh, and then try to come up um, with um, an inventory uh, of what that would mean. Now, um, I wanted to close a little bit 
um, and, and I know I have to, um, by saying, well, should we still call it cultures of reasoning or have we actually moved so far on this sliding scale away from logic that we're not longer talking about cultures of reasoning, but really about cultures of validation? That's a, a beautiful German word for it would be Geltungskultur. So uh, it would be how you validate certain, certain claims. And I, I think I'm, I'm more and more drawn to um, uh, trying to understand cultures of validation instead of um, cultures of reasoning, because it allows you to operate um, further away from logic, but also in a much more real world scenario. Um, and so what I'd hope to do um, in the future is sort of to try and understand more about the different spaces um, in which cultures of validation can be identified, look into specific epistemic situations like a quack entering a village making a, or a, a, a legal counselor making an appeal, writing a claim, um, in order to understand um, on a micro level what is going on there and see what values sort of shape the outcome um, of all that. In the long run, I think that could also be applied not only to China, where they didn't have an organ, but just as much to Europe. Because this idea that in, in Europe, the, the organ actually mattered, I think also needs to be revised quite heavily. The functions of um, explicit rules of reasoning may have been far less important than we think for actual practices of argumentation. And so if we write the global history of cultures of validation or cultures of reasoning, I think China is prime evidence that these theoretically explicit theoretical rules may not be so important after all. And that would be kind of healthy also to correct some other Eurocentric um, prejudices. So that's it for now. Thanks for your patience. Sorry for going over time. I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kurtz. So we will now open the chat for questions. So please feel free to either um, raise your hand uh, if you'd like to appear on the video or uh, type your question into the chat box and we will read it for you. Um, but perhaps um, just as we're waiting for a couple of questions to come in, um, I might sort of take an opportunity to ask my own. So, um, Professor Kutz, so I, one thing that I'm curious about, um, so obviously this is a, a, a huge project, um, many different kinds of, uh, of textual sources, yeah. um, textual sources about practices. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about um, sort of the role of, of literature as well in this project, um, or perhaps instances where the um, sort of standards for argumentation or reasoning are being sort of self-consciously played with. Um, yeah. It's prime material. I, I wish I was a literary scholar. Um, Robert Hegel's collection with Catherine Carlitz together about writing the law is, is a great source for that. And of course, all, all these um, um, stories, Feng Meng Lung is a great source about quacks. Um, Andy Schoenbaum in his book uh, on novel medicine has, has written a lot about that. So clearly literature is one of the prime sources because it makes, um, well, it shows how people try to deceive. Um, it, it shows also what the epistemic ideals were that they actually violated or catered to. Um, and it also shows how we're all kind of um, not able to actually live by the epistemic ideals that we have. So literature is, is clearly one of the prime materials that we have, but it depends very much. So, so what, I, what I think right now should really be in the center of our attention is specific epistemic situations, as some scholars have called them in the history of science, where you look into something, so the patient healer in, uh, encounter, for instance, um, and that can be gendered as well, sort of between uh, women and, and their physicians, doctors, um, whoever comes in, um, and men, and then try through a multitude of sources. So the official accounts, the manuals for the doctors, um, and also literary accounts, or maybe legal documents, to see how much we can find out about one specific situation, and then describe the situation on a micro level, and then move to the next one, yeah. is what I would do right now, I think. Um, thank you. Um... So I'm just going to see if we have any questions. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so, um, you know, GLA, I'm going to unmute you. Um, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? OK. Yeah. Um, wonderful. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I, as uh, for the first talk already, um, I'm, I'm really taken on the uh, persuaded by by your arguments, uh, Joachim. Um, today, I I had uh, one question that uh, struck me when you said uh, in your run up to your final case studies that mm -hmm. you said you wanted not to focus on rules of logic, 
um, but rather find them in texts, um, but not in the sense that Birgit Kellner and others did that they formulated something and then looked into the text and lo and behold, they found it. Um, so, and then you demonstrated your case studies, but your case studies, um, at least I had the impression, were mostly working from, again, from kind of rules. It, it, they were not necessarily the rules of logic, but from pre prescriptions. This is right. what you should do. And then you went ahead and looked for exactly that. I, I see the benefit of that, surely, but would you think it is also possible to do what it seemed that you first said, namely that you do not operate on rules laid down somewhere, but just go from the texts and then somehow, I don't know how, and maybe it's a stupid idea, but to find um, was... things in the text that you kind of discover and then describe them instead of just trying to match rules that exist. Right. No, exactly. So first, I, I have to um, clarify, not, not the critique uh, of Sarah Ackelman and, and Birgit Kenner, quite on the contrary. I think what they did was actually brilliant, but they also had things to go on. Because in, in Buddhist logic, you have certain explicitly uh, codified rules. And the same was true for medieval um, uh, monastic logic. You had in the obligationes, you had an obligation, and the obligation was spelled out. And so the reason is that not that they failed, I failed. To, uh, because I was unable, and I still am unable, or a little bit hesitant, to actually prescribe rules, even though they are inferred from all the material that I read, and put them in a form that can then be used in the same manner. That at the beginning, that was our goal, that we thought we have to somehow infer, inductively find the implicit rules and make them explicit, and then say, aha, this is what they followed. Um, so far, I mean, I got carried away by the material. So far, I find it much more interesting not so to, to um, narrow it down to rules, but just follow the practices and try to understand them and put them in a larger context that sort of also has um, cultural um, implication that has so, social uh, power relationships and, and other things. So, so maybe, maybe um, that could be done, but I haven't been able to do it yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you. And um, Professor Amelung, I think, has, has his hand up. Yes, thank you very thank you very much. Very interesting uh, talk. I've got, got one question, uh, which, uh, uh, let's say, one aspect you did not really mention. I mean, uh, arguing with natural phenomena, isn't that the most, uh, isn't that the most natural thing uh, one could think of? I mean, for example, like the sun is going uh, is going up every uh, day, or I mean, um, Mengzi says Shui Xing Zhu Xia, so water is flowing downward, and so on, and so on. And uh, uh, as far as I'm aware, I mean, that's pretty very very common actually. Uh, and I wonder how you can uh, how you how how you uh, integrate that into your uh, into your work. No, I should have talked more about that. Of course, observations are. All over the place, even in legal culture, sort of what people saw with their own eyes, um, also what physicians felt, as little as I know about medical culture, but I learned from other people, sort of, uh, of course, all this um, uh, factual evidence plays a great role. And as uh, very often we don't have doubts about factual evidence, it's sort of people do not necessarily, especially in legal contexts, um, declare that someone um, saw something that wasn't there. It's basically if if you make a claim that someone didn't see what they claim to have seen, it's because they were visually impaired or because they were lying. So there's no systematic doubt on the reality of, of observation. And so I should that uh, I should have made that um, a lot more clear. And of course, for um, anything um, like astronomy, uh, anything more scientific, uh, this is absolutely crucial. And I don't find a lot of doubts um, there at all. So you're absolutely right. That should be highlighted more. Okay, um, I think, oh, um, Brian Nichols, would you like to go ahead and unmute yourself? Thank you. <clears throat> Fascinating lecture. I'm so thankful that the invitation went out and I got it. Um, <clears throat> I'm learning so much. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I guess a couple of comments on a question. One is about the terminology we use to describe what we're trying to do, what you're trying to do. I understand. Um, <clears throat> I understand that uh, reasoning may have some norms that are are 
off-putting. <clears throat> um, cognition is a much more descriptive clinical term. Right? Validation, I mean, I mean, the you know, the, the Western canon is full of rules of validity. So I wasn't sure if that is supposed to be a connotation of the use of standards of validation, but those are quite formal in the Western canon. Whereas cognition, I mean, <clears throat> at least I guess I, I'm using the term cognition in my own work, and I would love to see, I would love to see some better connections between this material and what I'm trying to do. Um, <clears throat> the second question also concerns a term, a very technical term you used in your talk. Um, that was gibberish. Um, mm. <clears throat> so I, uh, <clears throat> you know, so if you look carefully at the, the let's see, this is the Nei Jing, right? <clears throat> um, and I, so I did a little study using some close reading and also some, some data science stuff with text on the Nei Jing and a couple of other early texts. And I was up, <clears throat> so I found that the there are lots of acupuncture points used for effective treatment of tonsillitis, just tonsillitis. So I isolated a condition. And I found a whole slew of meridians that are supposed to activate or cure tonsillitis, like <clears throat> the hand Tain meridian, the hand Yangming meridian, the foot Yangming, the ear, uh, bladder, et cetera. All of those are linked. <clears throat> so I was wondering, with reference to the the latter parts of medical science, um. <clears throat> Is are we are you whatever it is that you meant by gibberish? I mean, so gibberish is not merely a matter. I don't mean to put I'm, I'm being a little facetious here, but I'm not putting undue weight on the term. But there's something important that you're getting at. And, and that's somewhat related to deception. Obviously, it's used in the medical establishment to by doctors to deceive patients for profit. Um, but is the, is the concept also applicable to to textual sources? It seems like it would be maybe not for profit, but for influence. And so when I, when reading, when reading a little bit about the, the, when finding the Neijing's diagnostic cognition and also um, it's, it's, you know, curative cognition, it's very similar. Um, is that, I, I guess I want to, I want to, I want to know what you might think of that. Uh, <laughs> Let me start with that. So I, I think Lena knows much more about medicine, so she will jump in in a moment. I, in no way did I say that the Neijing or, or any um, sort of um, canonical formulation of Chinese medicine is full of gibberish. What I was trying to show is that these these um, handbooks for itinerant physicians, for these um, um, quacks, basically, what they made out of it, they put took bits and pieces. They were completely um, 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 uprooted from their systematic context and all that. And that that's what I meant by gibberish. So they're just making stuff up because they want to sound like someone who actually understood the system. So it's not at all a denigration of Chinese medicine or, or whatever. It's these people who actually actively want to deceive and know that they're deceiving. So it's not at all, not at all sort of a denigration or at any judgment even about Chinese medicine that I want to pass. It's just sort of in relation to what was canonical medicine at the time, these people were abusing it, very consciously abusing it to deceive people. And that's why I find them interesting. So it's you know, just to clarify that, and then Lena can tell me about the, the real uh, meaning of what I was talking about later. Um, uh, about the other things, so cognitions, I'm, I'm very um, careful about, I'm, I'm afraid of, because that, that's something, as soon as I talk to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, sort of, they know exactly what cognition means and, and how you do it. And I think for dead people, it's, it's very hard sort of to conduct experiments and to see whether they got it or not. So I, I try to avoid cognition, although I, I can see that it can be done. I'm sure you, you do it um, responsibly in your work. What I would defend, though, and, and that's something, well, it was one reason why I didn't dare to put it in the title of my lecture, is that this thing about validation and validity. So in the old German, you have two different terms. One is validity, that means gültigkeit, that refers to the truth whether it's true or not. That's what you say, it's highly formalized. And we have all these books by Brandom and, and, and other people sort of who, who tell us about standards of validity. Great. We have another word called Geltung, which is validation. You know, um, Habermas has written on facticity and validation in, in that sense. That basically means how things become recognized, accepted, and all these other things. Um, for this process of validation, the formal validity might be one criterion, but very often it's not the most important one. Um, and, and so um, I, I would have liked to talk, but I don't know how to talk about it without uh, raising misunderstandings in English about these cultures of validation, because that's something that I actually think is helpful. So we look into things where truth claims are made, defended, but they're also operating in a context where expectations play a role, where social hierarchies play a role, power structures play a role. And this whole setting, I think, 
is the culture of validation in which a certain epistemic situation takes place. And that's what I would like to look at in the long run. I, I don't know if I can ever do that in English, but um, therefore I, I stick to cultures of reasoning, but reasoning is very much about just statements uh, and propositional truth, right? Uh, and and or, or propositional uh, accounts. And, and clearly with these quacks and also with the, the legal practitioners, much more than making statements or propositions are involved. There's a performative dimension that that's this whole context that they establish. So I need a term, and if anyone has one that is actually fitting, you know, it's a it's a ten dollar thing. If you send it to me, I'm 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 happy ever after. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, Lena Springer. Yeah, I, I'm I'm so delighted by this talk, and um, of course I'm. It's, it makes me so happy to see that you bring out um, the people in Chinese pharmacy um, and Chinese medicine, who, who they act actually are. It's not just a drug um, from a journal. It's actually people, historical people and historical texts. So um, well, first we see what is really happening when somebody wants to say, is this working? Is this a drug or not? Um, does it work or not? And um, I want to ask you, as a kind of approach, do you think <clears throat> there's one way to go about this, which is to say, there's philology, there's science. So let's look at it together. Natural phenomena, but also just transtextual evidence. One text saying the other text is wrong. No, this is right. Or um, then we could also say, we could look at craft, like more technological things. Somebody tried to show something in a laboratory or as a technology, and someone else said that it's wrong. Should we mix this with religion? When somebody says, we did a ritual, so in another source, this would not be seen as a technology anymore. This would have been part of religion. It has a miraculous function. So. Do you think it is better? Because I, I liked when you emphasized that we should pull different sources together. Is it better to pull together aspects of philology and science or of technology and religion and then show that at different times and in different um, sources, they have a different meaning? Or would you prefer to have one case and that's it? Um, I put some names in the in the chat. So what, what I think is, um, in, or what I would prefer. So because I'm not a historian of the law or of medicine, and I don't understand the science behind it better than, I mean, I, I read up and I tried to, you know, not make a complete fool of myself, but I don't know. So I'm not an expert at all. So what I, what I would prefer for my interest would be to look into these epistemic situations. And then in order to understand them, I would go for any source I can find, literary, you know, the, the manual that, that may have informed medical practice, um, the legal <laughs> um, regulations that may have applied or may not have applied in order to, to create the richest picture I possibly can can create and then to determine whether it was actually that the, the efficacy of the drug that convinced the patient or whether it was the rhetorical skills uh, of the doctor who did that. I mean, because they didn't know before they take it. They may have heard that someone else didn't die after they took this powder or not. So in order to understand how people become convinced and validate certain arguments, accept certain truth claims, I, I would go for anything, visual evidence, whatever I have, the more the better. The, the richer the texture of what we have to describe an epistemic situation, the better. Same for religious situations, if, if that's an answer to your question. Yeah, yeah, this is so helpful. Uh, just a quick, once I was in Erlangen and looked at these all these Maoist books and I found a little book from the 30s. So Ding Fu Bao says, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, it's lovely. So what do we tell the lawyers if we want to do some Chinese medicine business? And then it's a very little book and it has all sorts in it, chemistry, old text, citing someone else, yeah, a survey in, in the certain market. Yeah. yeah. If I may, one addition to that, I mean, in this in this volume that Martin and I did, and and Ari sort of on science of fertility, Matt Sommer has a beautiful essay um, on forensics, and he collaborated with someone in the medical faculty because a claim that he found very very often is that if people are poisoned by arsenic, their spleen glows black, and so we went over to the medical faculty and said, is that actually true? The answer is no. Um, but it's something that he found again and again and again in in case records as proof, and and people were put to death on that 
alleged evidence. And so, of course, we also then have to work together with the people who actually look at the spleens and, and know what's happening. Um, so so I, I once again, sort of I, I cross any disciplinary boundary that we can possibly cross. Very much. And I think we just have time for one more quick question. Um, so Benjamin. Well, thank you for this fascinating talk, Professor Kurtz. Um, I have a quick question actually about how exams were uh, assessed. I, I happen to read a discussion by Li Zongwu, who's kind of famous for writing actually about deception uh, right. in officialdom. But he right. says that when he was young in Sichuan, he used to often win kind of practice examination uh, contests and prize money by writing fan an essays, which would kind of overturn established verdicts. And I was mm. wondering whether this is uh, something that was maybe just unique to that moment in time, or whether we can see other people saying that this is how you write an essay, you overturn an established verdict. Thank you. Right. I'm not the person to answer that. So Ibo might know more, Rui Magone knows a lot more, Alex Deforge knows even more on that, and, and, and Uli knows a lot about that and has looked into, into these things. So there's people who, who work on that. Um, but what I will say is uh, there's so much going on with examination culture, with the didactics, with sort of um, emulating model essays, with trying to deceive uh, and cheat your way in and out of that. That's, that's It's an ideal field. There's so much there. You know, so, I, I mean, one guy can't do it all. I would encourage you to look as far and wide as you possibly can if you if you need another project on your on your plate, um, and look into precisely that because it will also tell you a lot about um, what examiners were looking for. Um, was it just conformity they were looking for? It, it changed over time, of course. Or was it certain statements? Was it certain rhyme schemes that they actually preferred over others? So there's so little we know about exam culture. As, as a larger field and how exam culture was validated and how or, or why so many people with all the you know scorn they heaped upon the examiners and all the, the charges of corruption they still all believed they had a fair chance right otherwise they would just stop going and, and so i find that's a miracle and Rui Magone has argued that that was basically what held the empire together if people didn't have a belief in the exam the empire would have fallen apart and i, I think that's a very plausible argument so so by all means you know whatever you can find there Go after it. I think it's gold. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much, Professor Kurtz, uh, for such a rich um, and incredibly thought provoking talk, firstly, but also, um, as many of you know, the Methods in Sinology um, project is a volunteer run project. Um, so thank you, Professor Kurtz, for, for giving up your time to talk to us today. Um, if there are any further questions, please feel free to reach out to the Methods in Sinology team at in Sinology on Twitter. Um, you can also join our mailing list on our website. Um, and finally, uh, we hope to welcome many of you back again on the th uh, February 13th at 4 p.m. Uh, CET, so a slightly different time, uh, for Karine Kemmler's talk, uh, How to Read an Ancient Chinese Mathematical Problem. So thank you all again and hope to see you very soon. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>